Okay, so what I want to do in this class is to look at one tiny part of the video compression process. So we, we saw an overview yesterday of how you can make one frame by reusing parts of a previous frame, even if it's moved, even if the frame, even if the block has moved around from one frame to the next, the compression algorithm can find it and reuse it. And that part of the process is what makes video compression so asymmetrical. And by asymmetrical, we mean that compression requires much more effort, much more time, or many more computations than the decompression. So most of the parts of the video compression process take as long to do as they take to undo. The compression is about as complex as the decompression. But this one part of the process is very asymmetrical. And that's called block matching, that part there. So as we saw in the previous class, video compression algorithms like to reuse parts of a previous frame to construct the current frame. And so these blocks up here in the current frame can be copied and pasted from the previous frame which the, transmit, which the receiver already has. A problem arises when things move. So this block here is very different from the corresponding block in the previous frame. But it turns out the information that we are looking for is in fact there, it's just moved. Okay, and so the, comp the compressor, um, something's gone wrong here, sorry. The compression algorithm needs to find the block in the previous frame that matches the block in the current frame that it's looking for. So on the right there we have the block in the current frame that we are hoping to not have to transmit. We're hoping that somewhere in the previous frame that block is there. The somewhere is the hard part. So in the previous frame we need to find the location of that target block. So we're hoping this block here is somewhere in here and the hard part is finding it. So if you remember where's Wally or where's Waldo depending on what, what part of the world you're from he has different names. Like he's in there somewhere but finding him is a lot of work. No, actually, once you know where he is, you know, copying and pasting him is very easy. Once you know where he is, if someone gives you the location, it's very easy to get that information. And so the receiver is just told, oh, the block you're looking for is at position, you know, minus 7 plus 12. And it just goes and gets it. But finding that information first time is, is hard work. Could narrow it down a bit. I could tell you he's in here somewhere. Can anyone see him? Yeah, he's down there um, by the, let's see. Now you know where he is, he's very easy to see him. It's, it's easy, it's easy when you know. And that's why the decompressor's job is much easier. Because it's easy when you know, it's just told where the block is. But the compressor has a much harder job. Because it's told the block is just in there somewhere. Okay, so how does, it, how does it go about it? Well, for starters, it only does the searching based on the luminance of the pixels. So it only considers the luminance values. That reduces the computational effort significantly. Because if you had to compare the red, green, and blue values 
of pixels, that's more work than just comparing the luminance. And we've seen in other lectures that, to be fair, the bulk of the important information tends to be in the luminance component. If you separate the luminance and the chrominance out, most of the important stuff is in the luminance. It does mean it can make mistakes. You know, you could have two blocks that have very similar luminance, but actually quite different chrominance, and, and it could get it wrong. But for the most part, um, just doing the luminance reduces the amount of effort, and so the payoff is, is worthwhile. So this is the thing I gave you at the start of the class. And I've, I've reduced the complexity of this by just giving you a block of pixels that's four by four pixels. Typically, the blocks are eight by eight pixels. So if you're a compression algorithm, on the bottom right there, that's a block of pixels that you believe is somewhere in the previous frame. And you would like to know the location of that block so that you can say to the receiver or to the decompression algorithm, the block you're looking for is at position whatever, whatever. But the problem faced by the compression algorithm is of this magnitude. You know, it's in there somewhere. That's pretty much all, all it's got to go on. So it compares the first block with the block it's looking for. So the block that we have that we want to not transmit, the block we're looking for, we call that the target block. So this here is the target block. And in each block we're looking at, that we're evaluating, we call that the candidate block. And of course, we might not even find a perfect match. We probably won't find a perfect match. We just want the best candidate. We want the best match. So we look at the, each candidate block, and we essentially keep going. I mean, does that look like a good match? Not really. Does that look like a good match? No. Does that look like a good match? No. Does that like look, look like a good match? Better than the other ones, but I wouldn't call it good. Is that it? No. Is that it? No. Is that it? No. Is that it? So where is it? It's in, it's in there somewhere. So you can see that's a complex job. Did anybody find it? It's kind of... Um, show me roughly on the page where it is. Yeah? Here? Here? Really? Here, is this it? But it's like white, grey, grey, white, isn't it? This here is you're saying the start of it. Yeah, Alright, that's the centre of it. Mm, I don't know, I don't know. I think it's down there somewhere, I'm not sure. Ah, oh, there it is, okay. So... Now, once you know where it is, the job of copying and pasting it out is, is trivial by comparison. But finding it is hard work. And so that's what I wanted to impress upon you, was the, the complexity of that task. You know? Now, you're human. It's much easier for you to do something like that. For a machine, it really does have no choice but to just go along one by one by one and compare them all. So. Typically, what the compressor does is that it considers the position of the target block 
in the current frame and then does a search centered around that position in the past frame. And it typically wouldn't search the whole past frame. It would just concentrate on a particular area. That might be a square area or it might be rectangular. As it turns out, motion in video occurs much more from left to right and right to left than it does from top to bottom and bottom to top. Do you mean things typically move across the screen? They don't move up and down so much. So that would justify using a rectangular wide search area rather than a square. But the point is that it confines the search to a limited area in the past frame and it's centered on the position of the target block in the current frame. No. A matching function then it's called is used to score each candidate. So each candidate block gets a mark and then the one with the best mark is chosen. One of the most popular marking schemes is the MAD, mean absolute difference. And this is called a matching function or a distortion function. And basically this is a mathematical representation of that but algorithmically, it's much easier to understand. You just compare each pixel in the block with its equivalent in the candidate block, and you subtract, the va subtract one from the other, and then you, um, if it's negative, you just make it positive. So if it's minus five difference or plus five difference, doesn't matter, that counts as five, and then you add those all up, and that gets you a score. So um, I've contrived some very small examples here just to give you an idea. So here we have pixels that have a range of values 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So there's five possible values. And we're going to compare each pixel in the target block with the corresponding pixel in the candidate block, get the difference, absolute that, sum them all up, and then we'll get the mean absolute difference. So here, for example, um, this pixel is a value 3, and this pixel is value 2. So 3 minus 2 is 1. Here, same again, we get 1. Here, it's 3 minus 3, so it's 0. Here, it's 3 minus 3, so it's 0 again. 0 again, 4 minus 3 is 1, 3 minus 3 is 0. Here we have 0 minus 1, which is minus 1, and when you do the absolute of that, it becomes 1. So it's not like if the, um, you, you need to do that absolute because otherwise, if you had differences in the other direction, you'd be um, counting them as similarities rather than big differences. And so in total then, this would get a score of 6. Now it's mean absolute difference, so you should actually get the mean of those, which would be 6 divided by 9, but it doesn't matter. 6 is a perfectly good value too. Okay? So the lower that score, the better the match. Here, the mean absolute difference, um, we've got a 3 minus 2 will give us a 1. This is a 4, and the corresponding pixel is a 2. So 4 minus 2 is 2. Here we have a 3 and a 3, so it's 0. Here we have a 0 and a 3, so it's minus 3, which gives us 3. And so we add all those up, and we ultimately get a score of 11. So this tells us that this block here on the left is a better match than the block in the middle for this target block. Visually to me, they both seem pretty much equally bad. Um, but I guess this, is, this white here is quite extreme when you're trying to get these 
graze here. What do you think the mad might be for this one? Do you want to hazard a guess? If it's a zero minus, we said that was a, that was a shade, that shade there was three, two. Okay, so it's zero minus two would be two plus two. That looks like a zero. Anyway, it turns out to be, oh yeah, so you could work it out there. Let you work it out there, so. Assume these numbers are correct. I got 10. Okay. So it's saying that this rightmost block is a better match than this one at least, but the best candidate is the one on the left. So it has the lowest MAD, so it's the best match. Now your algorithm might decide then that you need a minimum, or sorry, there's a, there's a maximum MAD that you'll accept, and if you don't find one, that's similar enough, you just say, I give up, here's the block, I'm going to transmit it. So there will be a quality threshold there, a point at which you say, look, I didn't find something good enough, I give up, I'm just going to transmit it. Okay? The mean squared difference is essentially the same thing, except instead of um, doing an absolute, where uh, 2 minus 4 would give you minus 2, and you do an absolute to give you two, a four minus, sorry, a two minus four would give you minus two, and you square that. So that would give you a four. So the mean squared difference gives a higher importance to large differences. So if you had, you know, three pixels that were close but not quite and then you had another three pixels where two were perfect and one was off in the MAD they might work out to be the same but in the MSD the mean square difference you pay a big penalty for a big difference because it gets squared This is said to be perhaps a better match, matching criteria. But it turns out though that doing squares is vastly more complex mathematically than just chopping off the plus or minus. So although it's better, it's more complex. So overall, it probably doesn't get you the job done quicker. You know, you want to be efficient. And so this is certainly better, but it might not be good value. Um, so that's pretty much what I just said there. So like, you're going to have thousands and thousands and thousands of blocks to be compared. And that's very time consuming. So doing a square thousands and thousands and thousands of times is going to take you longer in the long run than just doing the um, absolute function okay so the difference in quality is typically not worth the extra effort but this has only been borne out experimentally where you actually say okay do this and i'll measure how, how long it takes you i do this and i'll measure the number of computations no. Even if you only have a very small target area, so like I said, we confine the search to a small area. Even if it's small, you can end up comparing a lot of blocks. So if a block can move, say, 30 pixels in any direction, right, you'll end up evaluating 3,721 
candidate blocks. As it turns out, if you do the maths. Evaluating each and every one of those. So if you were to look at every single block here on your sheet and give one a score, that um, is certainly the best way. You will find the best match in there. You can't but not find it eventually. So that's expensive, but, but it is slow. Now there's a whole bunch of block matching algorithms then that can do this job not as well, but they can do it quite, quite well at a much lower cost. So if, for example, you don't compare every candidate block in the search area, then you can save a lot of computational effort and still get a half decent, half decent result. So in this scenario here, um, the blocks were allowed to move plus or minus six pixels, which ordinarily would have given you 13 by 13 candidate blocks to evaluate. However, only the candidate blocks closest to the center of the search area are all evaluated. As you get further away from the center, we skip some. So that means if an object, for example, is moving fast across the screen, you might end up not giving it the best possible match it could have. But you know what? Things moving fast across the screen tend to be a bit blurred anyway. And we have to remember that all of this is happening at 1 25th of a second. So if it's not quite perfect, well, you know, it's gone soon. Certainly if things aren't moving at all, are moving very little, then it does make sense maybe to have the best available match for those. So that's the logic behind this. But in this case then, only 65 blocks are evaluated instead of 169 which is less than half. So already this compression algorithm has speeded up, you know, two times. At least. Okay? So this is the idea behind suboptimal -optim searches. We don't search each and every possible candidate block. We skip a few and hope it'll be okay. Some um, schemes use a hierarchical search. And the idea here is that often the candidate blocks that are closest to the ideal block will themselves be good. So let's say I was looking for the best wine in France. I, much and all as it would be enjoyable, I don't have time to taste wine from every vineyard in France. So I just get out my Google Maps and I say, well, look, we'll I have one from here, 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 and one from here. And so do a sample, an overview. And then say, okay, this is my favorite one then. Of all the ones I've tasted, this was the best one. So now I'm going to concentrate my search on that area. So I zoom in here. And then I do a sampling of, you know, every, every, whatever, every 100 kilometers or something, I do a sampling here. And I centered on the um, results of the previous search. 
and I discover that this is the best one here. So then I zoom in on that and I taste one in each of these and I discover that say it's down here. So this is based on the theory that the wine produced close to the best wine will itself be good. You know, I mean, if you were um, if you were a burglar robbing houses, you might decide that you know um, the house with the most money in it is um, more efficiently identified by a sampling thing like this because. Um, the houses around the house with the most money will also have a good bit of money. So depending on the scenario, that, that kind of assumption would hold. And so locally, at least, we find that the target blocks surrounding the best match are themselves quite good matches. So we can use that to, to home in on them, or hone in on them. Okay, so that's the idea at work here then. This is a search um, that was developed by some guys. And so at the first pass, they search, you know, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. And then the best of those becomes the center of a more focused search. Um, which is these here. So that's the best one when the, when the first search is completed. And so then the second search then is centered around here. So that's like a two pass search. In my example, I did, I did three. Okay. So the idea of a homing beacon where you have some measure, some signal that gets stronger the closer you get to the thing you're looking for. So if you're the Luftwaffe and you're planning on bombing London, if the BBC radio transmitter in London is sending out a signal, well, that's a metric, that's a good measure for that location. So if you keep moving in a direction that causes that signal to get stronger, you're going to get closer to the point you're looking for, which is why they turned off the radio during the war. Okay? So the values of the distortion function can be used by the matching algorithm to home in on the best match. That can um, be great. So if you are trying to find the top of a mountain, you could say to yourself, well, look, I'll keep walking in a direction that takes me higher, and eventually I'll get to the top, which could work. Or, of course, you could find yourself at a, a local minimum. So you might say, well, look, I'm getting higher, I'm getting higher, higher, higher. yip to do I'm at the top. Whoops, actually, no, I'm, I'm not. So the problem of local minima can be a problem. Sometimes the block matching algorithm gets stuck in the wrong place. And that can be an issue. And this is the, these are the details of it. One of the more commonly used algorithms. And so the idea here is that you start off with a step size of four, in this case and then you find the best match and then that comes the center of the next part of the process which is here when you find that the best match is the center of the area that you're looking at as is the case now well then you can reduce the size of the search area so the best match is here, is at the center. So now we reduce the size of the step. In this case, we've halved it. We're searching. So now it's like saying, okay, what's the MAD here? What's the MAD here? What's the MAD here? What's the MAD here? I already know what it is here. 
we find the point at which um, it's the best and then we do a, a search around those. So in this case, if you were to evaluate each of the possible candidate blocks, you'd have had to compare 289 blocks. Here, we're only comparing 22. So that's less than a tenth of the work. Now, of course, the problem is it might not be the best block. There might be one down here that was better. But in general, a scheme like this is good value for money. You get quite good results at a very good price. The better match that we might have found somewhere else might be slightly better, but is it worth 10 times the effort to look for it? And that's the, that's the question. It's even more than 10 times. No. Here's another one, and you kind of see, you start to see a, a theme here. In this one, eight points are on the center instead of four are searched. And then we reduce the size of the step at each stage. And so in this scenario, we compared 25 blocks instead of 169. So not quite one-tenth of the effort, but not far off either. So there's a whole other bunch of block matching algorithms that have been devised. And they all work pretty much the same, both different patterns. The important point, though, is the trade-off of the quality versus the cost. So if you were to devise a different block matching algorithm, the question is, would it give you better quality for less cost or better quality for the same cost? Okay, so the brute force search, which is what you were faced with looking at your sheet here where you had to go block by block, although as humans you didn't actually do that, um, is very time consuming. But you can use the kind of principle of locality where blocks near the best match are themselves also good. So you can just do a kind of a sampling of some sort. And when you get a whiff of a, of a good block, you can do a detailed search then around that. Even then, though, it's still highly asymmetrical. It's still a lot of work to find the matching block. So even if you reduce it down to a tenth of the effort, as we've seen, it's still effort. It's still work. Compared to the fairly trivial task of just going to the previous frame, extracting that 8 by 8 block of pixels, and copying it over into the correct position in the current frame to make the current frame. Excuse me. Now, some other tricks then that can be used. If we take a step back and consider the blocks in the current frame. So if you imagine our car moving across the screen in that, that illustration that we had. I mean, all the pieces of that car are moving at the same speed in the same direction across the screen. If, for example, all of the blocks surrounding the target block were moving in a particular direction between one frame and the next, well, you know what, maybe then that's a good place to start your search. Instead of its position in the current frame, Maybe you could decide, I'll start searching for it. I'll center my search around that position in the past frame where all the other ones have found to have moved. And often that then can save you effort because you do that quick calculation and then you've got a much better 
starting position for which to look for the other block. So you can sometimes exploit um, the relationships between the blocks. Temporal dependency is also something you can use. So like if between frame one and frame two, a block has moved like yay much, well then maybe between, between frame two and frame three, it'll also move yay much. So if this is a bullet or a car or a football, maybe it's traveling across the, speed, the screen, you know, in a straight line with a particular speed, and you can say, well, look, I'll start looking for it there. So, so instead of looking for this block at this position in the previous frame, well, actually, no, sorry, I'm talking about frame two. So instead of looking for frame two, am I? No. I'm talking about frame three. Basically, if the block has moved a particular distance between frame one and frame two, maybe you can hazard a guess that it's done the same again between frame two and frame three. Okay. Um, as well as being used then for video compression, block matching algorithms are also used for tracking objects in motion, as you can imagine. So if I have um, thousands of hours of police video, you know, instead of, and I decide I'm interested in this car here, you could use a block matching algorithm to track it from frame to frame. And you could track its path, for example. Okay. Any questions on that? So the important point here is that the block matching part of the process where you're looking for a match for the target block in the current frame that you can copy and paste. That you can tell the receiver to just copy and paste. Looking for that is very time consuming. And there are some tricks we can use to cut down on the cost of that, but it's still a very expensive process from a computation point of view. And that is what makes compression so much more complex and so much slower than decompression. Finding Waldo is much more work than just cutting him out when you know where he is. In JPEG, for example, the compression and decompression are pretty much the same. You know, one is as complex as the other. And so JPEG is symmetrical. GIF is symmetrical. But video compression, highly asymmetrical. And again, that makes economic sense. It makes sense that the RTEs and the BBCs and the Netflixes and the YouTubes of the world should be doing the work so that the thousands of receivers have a very easy job of it. We could have devised a scheme of compression and decompression that was more balanced. And so things would be easier for Netflix, but more difficult for us as the receivers. And of course, that's not desirable. Shifting all of the effort into the compression side makes a lot of sense. And of course, you only compress something once, but you might decompress it thousands of times. I mean, how many times does the same YouTube video get watched? It's worth putting all the effort into the compression side and having less effort in the decompression side. So the asymmetry comes from that. And it's kind of a side effect of the way the algorithm was devised. But it also kind of makes sense that if there is to be asymmetry, it would be all at the compression end. Okay, any questions? Okay.